Hello, today we're going to be having a look at the PMDG 737-600. So if you zoom out here and look at it on the ground, look how short it is. <laughs> it's like a, a mini version of the 737. And interestingly, if you look at it, the wingspan is actually wider than the aircraft is long. So it's got very good short field performance because of this. And it's got very good range because of this. So we're going to fire up the 737 from cold and dark on the ground and we're going to have a look around some of the systems on it. So let's just have a quick look in the PMDG store. It's only $34.99 which equates to about £28 in the UK. So it's actually really good money and the, the or really good value and the reason for that obviously is because it's very very similar to the 737-700 that came out recently. The only real changes here are the 3D model and the weights and performance figures for it obviously because of that. But otherwise it's the identical aircraft. It's telling that the release of this coincided with an update of the 737-700 to bring the avionics in line with each other. They are both exactly the same version number as each other. Okay. So let's jump inside the cockpit. The one thing I have taken a liberty with is setting the panel load state of the aircraft to cold and dark already. So I'm going to show you how I did that before we get started. So we're sitting on the ground at Stansted, by the way. So if you're wondering you know, where we are in the world and what's going on. So there's a bit of a trick in the 737, the PMDG 737s, to get the FMC up and running without having to power the aircraft up. You can just hold the mouse down on the menu key and it just powers up the FMC and nothing else. Okay, so I guess it's simulating it running on batteries or something. Okay, from in here, to, to modify the load state of the aircraft to, to make it start cold and dark, because by default it will start with everything running even if you put it on a parking space, go to the PMDG setup menu within the menu and you've got the startup state cold and dark, or it won't say cold and dark to begin with, so if you click in there you get lots of options so I'm guessing it would say apron typically so we can select we want cold and dark as our startup state and we can execute that and it means next time we start the aeroplane up in the sim we get it with nothing switched on if you want to change the state it's in right now you can select panel load uh, state load and then you can select cold and dark in there which I've already done obviously and you get cold and dark Okay, so if you get lost in the menus, just press the menu key and it comes straight back in. Okay, I'm going to press F, which centers our view up. We are going to go through the basic startup of the FMC and the, the aircraft today and do a quick flight. Now, it's worth me reiterating before anybody jumps down my throat about this. I am not going to follow all of the procedures of the, the checks and balances you would do with the real aircraft. I am purely going to do the functional things required, but I will try and describe along the way what we're doing and what happens in relation to those things. So let's go and have a quick look first at a little nav map. We are on the ground at Stansted Airport and I've roughed in a quick route that doesn't take very long to fly. We're only going to fly up to 10,000 feet and we're going to fly from Stansted over to Birmingham. So let's go and we, the re only reason for doing this is to set a flight plan up in the FMC to show you a little bit of that along the way. I'm going to be using shortcut keys as we move around the cockpit to, to easily move around and I will say them as I press them and I have got a printed checklist in front of me which I will refer to in the notes of the video. So I've waffled, waffled on far too long already. Let's get going with this. So the first thing we do to set up a 737 is turn the batteries on. So actually I'm going to stop there before we actually get into this. There's a shortcut we can follow. The main reason for going into the FMC before you start the rest of the aeroplane is a shortcut to go and connect the ground power. So if we press a menu and we go to FS actions we can connect the ground power to the aircraft straight away. So you can see ground power is here and we can request it. Okay, if we go and look outside you will see there is now a ground power unit and a cable has just appeared between the ground power unit and the aircraft. 
So if we go and look inside, this will change from connecting to release. There it goes. Which means we've already plugged in the umbilical outside, providing power from the outside world, which is great. And that will pay off a little bit later on in our procedures. So first thing we do, we press Control and 6, which takes us to that overhead panel. So looking from the cockpit, if you look up from where the pilot is, this is the overhead panel. Control 6 gives you a nice flat view of that. We're going to turn the batteries on. So the battery switch is over here, and we switch batteries on, and then we can close the lid on it. Next thing we're going to do is turn the ground power on. Now typically if we hadn't done that we would have to go and switch on, or the, the FMC would have come on in you know because the batteries are on and we could have gone and asked for the the ground power to be connected so we've kind of done that backwards. So we don't have to ask for ground power now and we can just say give us the crossover to ground power. So this whole area here with the bus trans area it means bus transfer what it really means is you're telling the aircraft where to get its power from so we've said ground power okay and in relation to that you can see lots of things have powered up fans have come on for cooling for the electric and we can get on with the rest of the the programming okay so then we go further overhead the first thing we're going to do is turn on the inertial navigation system. So we turn both of these knobs to nav. So the IRS system is the inertial navigation system. It uses the system of gyros to figure out how fast the aircraft is travelling and where you are in the world. And then we can move this knob here to HDGSTS and that gives us a status number of how many minutes until the aircraft's ready. It takes a while before it updates it, so we're not going to hang around watching for it to update. We are going to go, though, back down to the overhead panel. We're going to turn the emergency lights to armed, which is this switch in the middle, and close the lid on it. We're going to turn the window heats to on, so this prevents condensation building up inside the, the cockpit windows and we're going to turn the probe heats to on. So pro somebody asked me the other day what the probe heats are all about. If you look very closely at the front of the aircraft, there are these various sensors, or they're tubes, that relate to pieces of hardware inside the aircraft that measure air pressure. And they are used for your indicated airspeed, primarily, and your altitude. So they're measuring, the obviously, the air hitting the aircraft and the pressure of that air. So if those get frozen up, when you, because obviously at altitude the air is much colder, so if there is any precipitation in that air, or condense, any, uh, how, what's the correct word for it? If the air is dense enough, it could freeze and form water and, you know, freeze up those sensors. So you turn probe heats on so they are kept warm above freezing, basically. Okay. I'm just looking to my checklist, figuring out where on earth I am. So I'm on to the next page. So we're going to press Control 3 at this point. We're back down to the FMC, so Control 3 gives you this nice view of the FMC. And we're going to prepare our flight plan. So to do that, we go, if you're lost in here again, you just press Menu, which takes you to here. And you can see it's saying Enter IRS Position. So we go to FMC. So the bottom line of the FMC is both a message line and what's called a scratch pad. So if we were to type something in, it would appear in that bottom line. We'll see that in a moment. But for the moment, it's saying enter IRS position. So to do that, we go to pause in it. One of the kind of conventions in the Boeing FMC is it usually leads you to the next thing at the bottom right, particularly during setup. So if we say pause in it, the soft keys next to options will take you to those screens. OK, so you can see pause in it is here and it's got a row of square boxes here for the set IRS position. So what this really means is the inertial navigation system wants a reference of where it is in the world, because inertial navigation measures the movement of the aeroplane and figures out where you are now. So you need to tell it where it is to start with. So if we go... OK, so we need a longitude and a latitude to put in here. To, where do we get them from? We can see some up here. They're our last position of the aircraft, but that's no good because that might not be where we are now. So we say next page, and you can see there are two GPS systems on the aeroplane which have readouts. We can borrow one of those numbers, so we just select the soft key next to it, 
and it keys it into the scratch pad. Now remember I said you can key in here, so I can look, I can type in. So all it's done really, if I type clear, it will just remove those letters. So all I've really done by selecting a value that already exists is copy it into the scratch pad. So then I can go to previous page, back to where we were, and if I select the soft key next to an empty field, it will copy whatever's in the scratch pad into that field. And it's done it. OK, notice it's already got a reference airport, which is interesting. So I'm going to rekey that. Normally that would have hyphens. Maybe because I've been messing around with the aircraft, just making sure it was all working. So we're going to put EGSS back into that reference airport. And we'll go to Route. Yeah, it's good. It hasn't got anything in here. OK, so notice when we went to the Route page, it carried over the reference airport in the scratch pad. That's a nicety of the Boeing, because the next thing you're going to do is put that same airport straight into the origin. of The origin is where we're flying from. And the destination is where we're flying to, so let's have a look at a little map. The ICAO code for our destination, Birmingham, is Echo Golf Bravo Bravo. So Echo Golf Bravo Bravo. OK, and um, we can say what runway we are taking off from at Stansted, and it's runway 22. OK. Remember I said square boxes are a mandatory field, hyphens means that means the fields aren't needed. We can put a flight number in though. Don't touch company route, it has some secret source in it for loading flight plans, but we're not going to get into that today. So we're just going to make up a number and stick it in the flight number. Okay, that's the sun is shining on the legs button and making it very odd. Um, okay, so we've done the route. Next thing we might do is go to the performance initialization. So it's quite nice in the 737 that a lot of this is done for you. So there's not too much going back and forth from a, a tablet or anything like that. So if you select the zero fuel weight, obviously the plane knows how much it weighs without fuel. So you can select that, it will pre-key it in and drop that number into zero fuel weight for you, for you. And off the back of that, it's calculated the gross weight. So it knows what weight it is now as well, based on the fuel you've already put in. So there's a few things here that are kind of automatic, which are quite clever. Um, we can put in how, how much reserve fuel we want. We'll just say one. So that's, that's in thousands of pounds, typically. And cost index. The cost index refers to a formula, which is how aggressively the plane can accelerate. So it can be anything from a low number like 10 up to in the hundreds and you typically get it from your operational flight plan so if you've planned your flight on something like Simbrief that churns out this huge report at the end called an operational flight plan which has all this data in it so it'll be telling you how much fuel to put in the aircraft therefore you'd know all your numbers for this cost index so we'll, we'll just put in 50 we're just going to stick a number in because we're again like I said we're not following procedures here we're just functionally getting this plane up and running cruise altitude we're going to fly at 10,000 feet now you can enter at the altitude into the FMC either as a flight level or as a number or a feet number flight levels times a hundred are feet so divide your feet by a hundred and you get the flight level so if I put in 100 for example that means 10,000 feet and it will understand that that's what we mean so it knows that's 10,000. Once you get above 10,000, say if we went for 360, it will actually say FL. See? But if we put 100 in, notice that's working out the outside air temperature for us automatically as well, based on the altitude, which is quite cool. And we can execute those changes. So the next thing we might want to do is the N1 limit. So this is the acceleration on the runway and the climb out, basically. So by default, it's going to go for full beans, for want of a better phrase. You can derate it. So you can choose a different climb profile to not use as much fuel. So we are going to then leave that alone then, and we'll go to the takeoff data. So this is where we can set the, the flaps for takeoff. So we'll say we're going to use five degrees flaps. So I'll key in five into the scratch pad and copy it into the flap field and that has automatically calculated the rotate speeds for the aircraft so as we accelerate down the runway we'll get the call outs from the co-pilot of the the rotate speeds and we can transfer those across just by clicking on 
the numbers. So those are the calculated values and those are the values it's put in. The reason it's able to calculate them is because we've now chosen the runway. We've told it about the acceleration parameters. It knows the weight of the aircraft so it can work out you know, when the aircraft would be airborne based on the flap level as well. Centre of gravity is an interesting one. So if we just select it, it will pre-calculate it based on the weight and where the fuel is in the aircraft and the passenger loadout. You can say this is the centre of gravity and you can drop that in and it gives you a trim number. So if we then go and press F, you can see that trim number was 5.57. It relates to this gauge here and the wheel. This is the, the main trim wheel for the elevators. So what you're doing here is setting the aircraft up so it's already trimmed for equilibrium on the runway. And what that means basically is as you accelerate towards the speed at which the aircraft can rotate, the aircraft is not going to balloon around and suddenly gain lift on the runway. So we're going to hold the mouse down on this trim wheel and move it until this needle gets to about 5.5. So we just, if we zoom in on this, just so we can see it a bit, bit better. So we're pre-programming the trim. So the aircraft is in equilibrium, as, il equilibrium, sorry, as it accelerates along the runway. And the reason for doing that, yeah, like I say, is to stop the nose lifting in an unanticipated manner. So we'll press Control 3 again. Okay, so we've done that. Next thing we're going to do is set up the departure and arrival as our route. Now, there's something interesting about this, we'll get to it in a moment. So we're going to go and click on Depart and click on Departure. So we're setting up how we are leaving Stansted. So it already knows runway 22 because we specified that earlier. But we can use a standard instrument departure route if we want. So all they are are pre-programmed. A standard instrument departure is a pre-programmed sequence of waypoints. So And they have names. So this one that follows this route here out of Stansted is called NUGB1R. So you can't see it here on the page, but there are three pages of them. So if we go next page and next page, there it is. NUGB1R. So we'll select that standard instrument departure. And then we can click on Root and Activate and execute that. So this might seem very strange, that we've been able to activate our route with only half of the route filled in. And that's absolutely correct. Because in a real aircraft, the flight crew would not program the destination before they've left the departure airfield. They would do it en route, because they're going to be talking to the destination, and they would be confirming at the destination the standard approach route into the airfield, because there might be all number of reasons, you know, all manner of reasons why you can't choose your route ahead of time. <coughs> you may have been vectored to somewhere completely different because of something going on at the destination, for example. Or because of weather, even. Okay. Excuse me for coughing. I've got a very dry throat. Um, next thing we're going to do, then, is go back to Dep R. We actually, conversely, we are going to program our approach route just so we don't have to because we're just doing a demonstration flight. So if we go and look at Birmingham we are going to just use ILS, we're not going to use a standard approach route, we're just going to use ILS into runway 33. So ILS for runway 33 at Birmingham and we're not using a transition, we're not using a start so we just execute that change. Now en route we would like to do some extra waypoints just to line us up nicely. So if we go and look at the legs page, you can see here's the first few waypoints leaving Stansted. And if we go next page, you can see there's runway 33 at Birmingham, and in between the standard instrument departure and the approach into Birmingham, there's a, a discontinuity. So the flight computer won't figure out what to do in between. You have to instruct it what to do. So we want to go via the Daventry VOR, which is DTY, D, T, Y. So we key it into the scratch pad, fill it in, and it's filled it into our flight plan and pushed the discontinuity down one. So we also want to go via the OVDOV waypoint, O, V, D, O, V. O, V, D, O, V. 
and we can insert that into our flight plan and that's again it's inserted it and it's pushed the discontinuity down so we now want to close that discontinuity up so what we do is we select the next waypoint and then we select the discontinuity and what that will do is pull up everything below here up one line yep so it's pulled the rest of the flight plan up over that gap so now we know it is looking good notice it says here that's the modified route so we have to execute it and it becomes the activated or active route and we can have a quick look through and we can just see that there, there are no more discontinuities if we flick through the pages which is good so that's basically the flight plan done I haven't gone into detail about the weather in here or anything like that yet so we're we're not going to today because otherwise we can spend an hour talking about the flight management computer and we're not going to be using VNAV either for the same reason because we don't want to get into how all this works because we could be here for an hour talking about the ins and outs of flight management computers and you just want to see the airplane work and get up and running okay next thing we're going to do is press control and one which gives us a nice view of the master control panel for the autopilot and we can go and pre-configure things so on takeoff we haven't got too much work to do so first thing we're going to do is turn the flight directors to on okay so the flight there's two parts to an autopilot there's the flight director and the autopilot the flight director figures out based on the flight plan what the airplane needs to do to go the direction you have planned the autopilot follows what the flight director has worked out so you can see when we're in flight you'll see crosses on the displays which are the flight director um, but we won't see them just yet so we won't worry about them just yet so we are going to prepare now for flight so we take off the runway we're taking off on is 22 at Stansted the actual direction of that runway is 222 degrees so we're going to go and pre-program the heading of the aircraft to 222 degrees we're also going to set target altitude is already 10,000 feet that's fine we are going to set a vertical speed to say how we get there now this is pretty useless I'm just showing you that this is how vertical speed works really because at the moment we activate the autopilot it will take the vertical speed at that moment yeah so this is pretty much a useless thing to be doing something we will do though is set on switch on LNAV so that's lateral navigation basically it means the airplane is going to follow the flight plan yeah VNAV which we're not going to use today relies on filling all the data in on the computer which means the aircraft can do vertical navigation on its own as well so it will change flight levels throughout the the plan but you still need to have a cruise altitude plugged in okay um, we, again today we're not going to be using the N1 or the TOGA settings to take off we're just going to use max throttle because there's something else I want to talk to, to you about on the way of doing that um, set the barometric pressure so you will notice at the moment this might no it's not quite correct um, we can set the barometric pressure remember we talked earlier about measuring the air pressure outside for the altimeter if if we we can change this between inches and hectopascals there's two different number systems so if we look over here at this if you watch the number here it's in inches at the moment if we switch this over to hectopascals it changed the number here so it's the difference in America they tend to use inches in Europe they tend to use hectopascals for the barometric pressure and you can roll the knob here and notice the altitude changes as the the rating changes so basically you configure the altimeter for the local uh, atmospheric conditions so you would look at this on a chart or from a ask for ATC they would give you this information typically on the way to the runway or you just press B in the simulator and it pre-configures it for you which is just done for me okay so we're going to start getting the airplane ready for flight so overhead we go and turn on the seatbelt sign so seatbelts are here we switch it to auto we turn the yaw dampers to on if you ever wonder what the yaw dampers are the if you look at an airplane you've got the ailerons on the ends of the wings 
obviously as we move the stick around, obviously it's not going to work yet, we've got no hydraulics switched on, but as the ailerons move to roll the aeroplane, they create drag, but it's not an equal amount of drag from the aileron moving up and down, so the plane will yaw from left to right when you roll the aeroplane. To prevent that yaw, the, the roll dampers, well, sorry, the yaw dampers, um, introduce some rudder automatically to stop that yaw from happening in response to the ailerons. Okay, so that's what yaw dampers do. Cabin pressure. So down here we've got the cabin pressurization system, so typically when an aircraft climbs to high altitude, the cabin is lowered in air pressure until, um, I think it, for most airliners, the, the passengers would experience an altitude of about 8,000 feet maximum. So when you're, say if you're cruising at 38,000 feet in the aeroplane, the cabin pressure internally is held to about what you would experience at 8,000 feet. So it doesn't continue to hold the, the pressure of ground level because the aeroplane would have to be built so strongly and it would require so much air pressure to do that, they don't bother. It would actually put too much stress on the, the airframe over time. So they actually, you know, they, they bring the, the passengers up to 8,000 feet, which is why you feel your ears popping and stuff if you go on a long haul flight. Okay, so we've done the cabin pressure, the aft fuel pump number one to on. So we turn aft pump number one to on, the reason we do that is that will provide the fuel to the auxiliary power unit. So if we go into any auxiliary power unit to on, and then to start, and then it will flick back to on on its own, you will see this little needle here will start moving around and it will go all the way up to 7 and then fall back to 4. If we give it a few moments, it's saying low oil pressure, which is correct. That's just flickered. So this will move all the way around to 7 and then fall back to 4. So we'll wait for that to happen. What's actually happening while we're waiting for this is there's a jet engine in the back end of the aircraft starting up, which is the auxiliary power unit. So we'll wait for that needle to move. Is it going to move today? Let's go and have a look outside. It hasn't switched on, has it? Let's try again. It's interesting that it didn't switch on. Let's give it a moment. I can hear it. That's going to start pumping heat out any moment. There it goes. So if you look outside, there we go, look. So, that exhaust port on the back of the aircraft is the auxiliary power unit. So the, the purpose of the auxiliary power unit is to provide kind of bootstrap electrical power for the rest of the aircraft and compressed air. So you've probably heard the term bleed air. You can vent the air generated from the auxiliary power unit both to warm the cabin up. If we were following a full procedure, we might warm the cabin up using the hot air from the auxiliary power unit. Um, also, you can use that compressed air to spin up the main gas turbine engines. So if we look inside, something we've missed there while we were looking outside is the gen off bus light has come on in response to this being ready, the, um, the APU being ready. So this is the bus transfer again, so we are going to say now that we're going to derive electrical power from the APU, not from ground power anymore. So the bottom two switches, we flick them down. We are now using the APU for power. We're no longer using ground power. So we go and turn the anti-collision lights to on, because we're telling people on the ground we're getting up and running. There's all sorts of... Um, conventions around using particular lights to mean particular things to the ground crew and typically yeah, once we got on the aircraft you'll notice the position light was on steady straight away on cold and dark so basically what that would mean is as soon as we provided power the position lights came on outside the aircraft which basically tells the ground crew there's people on board and they're configuring the aeroplane. Um, collision lights uh, is another convention basically means we're getting ready to start engines. We've already got the APU up and running. Yeah. 
Okay. Packs. Uh, where are we? Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So, we are going to do bus transfer. We've done that. So then we go back down to the FMC and we're going to disconnect that ground power unit because we're no longer using it. So if we go to the menu button and we go to FS actions, go to ground services and we can release the ground power. Okay, so if we go and have a look outside, you will see this is going to magically vanish. Or at least the, the, the umbilical has gone. It's still there at the moment. And we're also going to remove the chocks while we're here. So, okay, it's saying it's removed. Does it magic? Yeah, it's magically vanished. So we can now remove the chocks. Now, that is a trigger in the simulator when we remove the chocks. It will close the doors, which you can see happening, and the stairs will be retracted away from the aircraft. So we are now running on internal power, and everything is getting out of our way, because they know we're getting ready to start, you know, to get the engines running, to get up and, up and going. So, first thing we need to do then to get the engines up and running, let's go overhead, we're going to turn all the fuel pumps on, because without fuel we can't run the engines. We're also going to turn on the APU bleed. So remember I said the auxiliary power unit provides compressed air to spin up the engines. So we turn on APU bleed, and you can see the duct pressure climbs. So this is the amount of pressure. Now. If you go flicking switches randomly around the cockpit and you go and turn the packs on, for example, you will see that you don't have enough duct pressure to spin the engines up all of a sudden. So don't turn the packs on before you started the engines, is the, the moral to that story. OK, we've got APU bleed on. We're now going to start the engines. It's quite straightforward in the 737. So. Just having a look around the cockpit to make sure we've got everything in the right places. So all you do, say we start with engine number two. The reason we start with engine number two, there's actually a good story to this. If you go reading on the internet, you can see several accidents that have happened with this. Engine two pre-arms or pre-pressurizes um, the hydraulics. So there, there's some funky piping on the aircraft. The engine number two pre pre-pressurizes the hydraulics for things like the brakes. If you started engine number one first, there is a risk in the real world that the aircraft would start rolling even with the brakes on, if it had been parked overnight for example, and it's actually happened in the real world, and the aircraft has rolled into the, um, the ground crews, because there's a small amount of positive thrust as soon as the engines are running. Obviously if you don't have working uh, parking brakes, you're going to roll into the the tractor for example. Okay, so we turn this to ground. You can use ignition left or right. We're going to use one one of each. Now, as soon as we switch that to GRD, the N2 number would have started climbing. N2 is the gas turbine. And you will notice it will flatten out. I'm going to let it flatten out to show you. It will get to about 25 on its own. So that's the compressed air spinning the engine round. Yeah. To get the engine to actually kick in and start running, we have to provide fuel, and that's done with the starter levers. So we move the starter lever for engine number two, and it will accelerate past that topping out. It was about 29%. I didn't think it would get that fast. Normally you do it as soon as it gets to 20. And you can see the fuel flow is increasing. The exhaust gas temperature is rising on engine number two, and the turbofan speed is now increasing. So there's a gearbox between the gas turbine and the turbofan. So if you have a look outside at these engines, there's two parts to the engine. There's the gas turbine in the middle and then there's this huge fan at the outside, which is the, the turbofan. So that's the N2, uh, sorry, N1. Yeah, N1 is the turbofan, N2 is the gas turbine. Okay, so something we've probably missed here, yeah. Notice that switch automatically went back to off, so it does that. So we can now go and switch this to GRD, switch this over to the left one. Again, you can leave these on the same side. I think they vary them just for wear and tear purposes of the actual parts that they're related to for ignition. So you can see N2 is coming up. As soon as it gets to about 25, we can move the start lever for engine number one. 
and you will see the fuel flow increases, exhaust gas temperature comes up and N1 starts to increase. Notice we have, this is an interesting one, I didn't think we had this much fuel on board. We got fuel in the wings and it's saying there's a config warning here. That's because we don't have the central fuel pumps on. So that's the centre tank, it's telling us a number full. So if we come up overhead and turn on those central fuel pumps, and we look down here now, that warning's gone away. So just to, the only reason we saw that is because I didn't actually fill the plane with fuel. I took it as read it would have some fuel in it and just jumped in and started programming things. Okay, so we heard a click there while I was talking. That was the starter moving back to off. Okay, so we've started the engines. Normally, it's worth pointing out, I'm on a parking spot here. Normally, you wouldn't start engines until you have been pushed or are being pushed back. Okay, just to get that clear before anybody again, before anyone jumps down my throat, we are following just functional stuff here. We're not following proper procedures. Overhead, bus transfer to the engines. So now the engines are up and running. We can transfer away from the APU. We no longer need it. So we're kind of using APU as a bootstrap, just a temporary source of power to get the engines running. And then we can use the engines for everything and not the APU. So we use the two outer switches on the bus transfer panel. So we are now using the, the main gas turbine engines to generate power for the aircraft. So we can turn off the APU. OK. Hydraulic pumps to on. So hydraulic pumps are up here. We turn them all on. So this is the control surfaces, you know, the, or the, the pumps that provide the hydraulic power for the control surfaces around the aircraft. Packs can go to auto at last. Oh, we can turn the APU bleed off now. Packs can go to auto. So that's the... You can hear the fans coming on. That's the air conditioning inside the cockpit and inside the cabin. Taxi lights can go to on. So we've got lights down here, taxi lights can go to on. Slowly working our way down, we're almost there. So we could start taxiing at this point, but we're going to do a couple of other things first. We're going to move the flaps to takeoff position. So I've moved my flap lever here. And if we go and I'm not sure if the numbers are actually demarcated on here. They are. So we said five degrees, didn't we? So I'm just moving my flap lever one more. And you can see the flap travel on this little meter here. So the needle, it takes a while for the flaps to arrange themselves because the wings are complicated. So you can see that's just very slowly moving. And it's now got to five degrees, which is what we said on the flight plan, if you remember. Um, okay, so we're gonna taxi out. So we're gonna come off of the parking brakes. just realised my throttles weren't in the correct place. Okay. That's interesting. Why am I getting such a high amount of thrust? Remember I said there was an amount of positive thrust. just going to try something to make sure my throttles are configured correctly and again this is first go with this aircraft so I'm just looking at the throttle throws okay so I, I've got the um, the Airbus quadrant I've got several videos about configuring this and I'm just going to put the parking brake back on so I can get to the levers for it So I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just making sure that the throttles are working correctly, the throws. Okay, that I have a whole video about configuring this because I've got the Airbus throttle quadrant. And obviously it is not a Boeing quadrant. It doesn't have the same throws, doesn't have the same axes. So if we're just taxiing out to the airfield to take off on the way we can go and turn some lights on so let's go and press control 6 just briefly we want to turn the strobes to flashing now
get out of the room eventually. So where are we on the airfield? Let's have a quick look. Okay, so we will go right and then left. A lot of people tend to like taxiing incredibly fast, but you're not supposed to. You won't see a, a real airliner going more than a few knots. It's worth saying I've got the simple traffic plug-in which has given me really nice liveries on the other aircraft. It's available from Aerosoft, it's really cheap and it just makes the simulator look a lot better. So you can see down here the flight plan is arranged. We've got it in the, the this is called the EFIS display. We've got it in um, map mode at the moment. You can change the range. You can also, actually we haven't configured a few things. Let's go and have a quick look. We'll, put, we'll stop before we come out onto the runway. I didn't turn on TCAS, did I? Which we would typically do during taxi or takeoff anyway. So TCAS is, where is it on this one? Have they moved it? Oh, is this a slight difference between the, between the aircraft? I think it might be. Interesting. I guess this is a newer version of the aircraft, so we're not going to worry too much. So it's got this different panel here. So we've got TARA. So it's already on by the look of it. Okay, we're not going to worry too much about that today. It's just a that's the first difference I've seen with the, the load out of the cockpit between the 700 and the 600. So we're going to go and pre-configure the indicated airspeed for the auto throttle to 220 knots. So once we take off, you will see me do several things in a row quite quickly. Obviously we're not using f air traffic control today, so we might get a phantom AI aeroplane fly straight through us. We'll have a quick look in the sky. Can't see anything out there. It's a, it's a funny little, looking little Boeing, isn't it? So uh, again, I've not flown this before. This is my first go in it. So we're going to find out what we find out, basically, as soon as we start accelerating. Let's reduce the range on this map so we can actually see what's going on. Okay, full throttle. Now, this is the reason I didn't go for the toga mode or anything like that on the throttles. I pushed them all the way forwards. Look, you can go beyond 100%. Which I'm doing on purpose, to be honest. Okay, so we move the gear to up. Turn the autopilot on. Will it allow us yet? It's trimming slightly. There we go, autopilot is on. Autopilot is on. Oh, sorry, um, auto throttle is armed and speed mode is engaged. So the aeroplane is now essentially flying itself. So we can, we'll leave it at 220 knots just to make this corner so it doesn't get too fast. And we'll raise the flaps. Because you can see there's a marker we're just about to pass on the indicated airspeed saying at what point you raise the flaps. So that's done. And we're basically done in terms of departing. So we accelerated down the runway, we pulled up. After a couple of thousand feet, you're allowed to engage the autopilot, which we did. Remember, we pre-configured LNAV mode. We switched on the auto throttle. Speed mode came on automatically. 
and the plane is now flying itself basically and it's climbing out at two and a half thousand feet ah so that didn't unless i just lucked into climbing in at two and a half by the time i engaged it i was anticipating that vertical speed though would reset to whatever i was doing as i left the runway so that's an interesting one what's something to look into So we have got a restriction coming up of above 3,000 feet. Obviously we're at 5,000 already because this thing is a rocket ship. So you can see there's a nice view across the... It's a lovely day in the UK. This is live weather by the way. So there's Stansted. And here's our 737-600. It's very nicely modelled. Okay, so now we've got away from the, the first turn, we're going to increase speed to 250 knots. We can then look on our flight plan here, we could go to the progress screen, and that gives us some nice calculated times along the route. Almost up to 10,000 feet already, which is quite amusing really. And again, for anybody that wants to jump on me and saying, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, all I'm doing is functional use of the aircraft and having a quick look around it. Okay, so you can click on this panel on the yoke, which moves out of the way so you can get to switches in the cockpit. It's worth pointing out, I've got the Airbus yoke. I have switched off the axis for the um, landing gear. Notice I've also gone and switched it off. On takeoff, we switch this to up to pull the undercarriage up. We subsequently move it to the off position, otherwise it's pressurising the undercarriage cylinders the whole time, which is ridiculous and obviously would cause wear and tear on the real thing. So the klaxon we heard there is we got within a few hundred feet of our target altitude. So you can see we're in that last hundred feet now before we get to 10,000. And the plane is happy cruising along. So if we go and look at the map, it's going to miss the turn, or we've probably got a, yeah, we've got a discontinuity here between what the aircraft thinks and what little nav map thinks the route is, yeah. So it's going to kind of be in the ballpark, but don't, don't worry too much about what little nav map thinks. It's not as clever as the 737, if that makes sense. So you can see this is absolutely nailing the predicted flight path. Okay, so this flight isn't going to take very long at all. Yeah, you know, we look, we should have been at 4,000 feet. We've again, this, I'm not following procedures. This standard approach, we should have been at 4,000 feet for Nagbo, but we're not. We're at 10,000 already. But it's quite nice for sightseeing purposes. <laughs> so the plane's flying itself. Remember earlier I mentioned about the flight directors? That's the crosshairs that you can see that's superimposed. So the flight director is is figuring out it wants the aircraft to be going in the direction of that crosshair in order to follow the flight plan. The autopilot is chasing that crosshair with the attitude of the aircraft. So we are at 10,000 feet, so we could accelerate, and so we will. So let's go for 320 knots. Let's see how fast this thing accelerates then. This little 737-600. Crikey! <laughs> Look at it go! I mean, okay, it's smaller and lighter, but I didn't anticipate it being that much smaller and lighter and faster. Whoa! The green line you can see here is the anticipation of when it will reach the target's altitude, 
you'll, it'll make more sense when we're descending. Something we can go and have a look at, because we are going to fly into Birmingham on the ILS, is make sure we've got the ILS programmed 110.10326 degrees. So what we can do is go down and look in the FMC and look at the... Actually, no, I'm getting confused between different aeroplanes now. We need to look down here. Here's the nav radios. So we want... 11010. So 110. We'll transfer that to be active. And the same over here. 11010. Transfer it to active. So we've got both of the nav radios agreeing with each other. And we want to set the course to the runway direction on both sides. So the direction of the runway was uh, 326, or the, the ILS, sorry, was 326 degrees. So we've got this course on this side, so we'll make the, we're just getting things ready in advance, really. So everything makes sense in the cockpit. Okay, so if we increase the range here, we can see what's coming. So, top of descent is coming in about 15 miles, if we follow the flight plan to the letter. But we can just play with the descent modes on the way, just to show you how they work. You can see, as you fly along the flight plan, it highlights the current route, or the current part of the route. Interestingly, you can go to plan mode on here, and when you go to plan mode, it zooms in on a particular step. And if you go to the legs page, it shows you the one that is centred is Daventry. If we say step, we can go and step along the route, and then obviously you can use zoom as well. Interesting, we can press TFC as well. I'm not sure if it will work on that mode, actually. Yeah, TFC, look, puts range rings on. If you switch TFC on, that will show other aircraft. So it's using the TCAS system to show other aircraft nearby. Obviously there aren't any at the moment. Okay, so let's start descending just to show you how this works. So say we came, wanted to come down to 5,000 feet. First of all, we're going to need to descend, slow down to 250 knots. Notice it hasn't started descending yet. We're still at 10,000 feet, even though I've said 5,000. That's because we're on altitude hold mode, and we haven't told it how to get to 5,000. So this is very much a target altitude. Yeah, and you can see it reflected here. So this is the altitude we're at, and this is the target altitude. So we're just waiting for the speed to come off. If we wanted to, to um, retard airspeed faster, we can just use the speed brakes. So if you haven't seen what the speed brakes are, there are those flaps that are now sticking out the top of the wings. And you can see a green line here on the indicated airspeed. That's the speed we will be doing. I think it's in six seconds time. So we'll remove the speed brakes and obviously the plane will come down at a more gentle rate. To 250. So we need to get down to 5,000 feet, so we tell it to do it at a given vertical speed. So we roll this round. Say, so come down at 2,000 feet a minute, please. And you can see the vertical speed is changing. And you've got the target there marked. Now we need to keep an eye on this indicated airspeed. Look, it's actually increasing. And this is the danger of using vertical speed mode versus level change. If we just do level change instead, the plane will get down at the best rate it can. So we could go for speed brakes now. And the plane will go more steeply to hit 250 knots because it can. It's doing a level change based on what we've configured elsewhere. So if I go for full speed brakes, So 
So while that's going on, there's something else I want to quickly show you. I think I'll see if I can find it. Uh, menu. Just need to get the door. Hang on a second. Okay, that's throwing me. Um, just as someone comes to the door, but so if we go to T D PMDG setup, you can go to aircraft and equipment, and I just want to have a look. There's 15 pages of this. I think it's on about. I'm looking for, and I can't remember where it is, and I don't want to spend too too long looking for this, is you can get the speed from the throttles displayed on the... E-tops, yes, default battery. I'm not going to worry about it. There is a setting where you can get your current throttle display to show up on the N1, which is really useful. I'll come back to that. Okay, so we're down to almost to 5,000 feet. We heard the clacks on there. And it's lovely weather, isn't it? So this is going to be an instrument approach. So we're going to take the speed off to 200 knots so we're not in a hurry. So it wants us above 2,000 feet at CF33, so we're going to drop down to 2,500. Let's just check the height of Birmingham above ground level. 315 feet, so we want about 2,800. So again, we can do a level change to do this. We don't have to use vertical speed. We'll go for 180 knots. Let's move the range. So if we go and have a look on the map to see where we are. Got a little way to go yet. We're about 20 miles out. So in order to get rid of that altitude quickly, we're just going to go for flaps now. It's a bit slow enough. Yeah, we've, we've gone past the up marker. We can go for flaps two, which I've already done. So you can see the flaps are traveling over here. We can remove the speed brakes now. It's a lovely day, isn't it? You can actually see we've picked up the... Uh, the signal from the ILS already. We've got the glide slope. We haven't got a localizer yet, but when we get a bit closer, we'll pick that up. So we're doing 180 knots. Let's have a look outside. Lovely day. Absolutely hammering it down. Oh, I kind of feel sorry my other half is in this part of the world this morning. And it doesn't look great, does it? She's watching the Commonwealth Games. She's taking the kids up to go and watch the rugby. I'm hoping they have got better weather than this. But yeah, we're in thick rain here. So the weather's obviously swirling around out there because the aeroplane is reacting to it. So let's switch this over to approach mode. Notice we can have both screens showing something different. So we've got approach mode on this side and on the co-pilot side we've still got the map view so we get a nice view of what's going on. 
So when we make the turn, we're down to 2,800 feet. When we make the turn, we will lower the gear. So we're five miles from the turn now. We start slowing down. Over 160 knots. Go for 10 degree flap. Get the gear down, I guess. Landing lights on. This is going to be a cool landing, isn't it? So this is using a, a course deviation indicator for the um, the approach mode display on the EFIS and. Obviously over here we've got this in plan mode which gives us the the flight plan on the way in and we can reduce the range on that. So you'll see the airport appearing on the far end of that line anytime soon and here comes the approach. So should we fly this by hand just for a bit of fun, for something to do? Here comes the turn. So let's notice the line has come in. It's slightly overshooting. 2500. So at this point, I'm going to turn off. That's just a warning that I've turned the autopilot off. Don't worry about that. So. Get my bearings on where the aeroplane is, so we're high. So just get the nose down. It's a while since I've flown the 737. Okay. Let's get this back under control, shall we? 2500. So we're off to the right, so we just correct that. We're coming back down onto the glide slope. Bleed some more speed off, let's put the air brakes out to accelerate that. F and see what happens with the views, it's quite cool. So we're going for full flaps now. Feeding in throttle. We're a bit low. Okay, and this is just rustiness with me weaving around a little bit. There we go, we're back pretty much on track now. So what we're looking to do is balance the indicated airspeed and the glide slope and the localizer. So gear's down, flaps are on full, so it's just stick and rudder at this point. Yeah, so this is actually dropping quite quickly, isn't it? We'll put the, the view higher up so you get a nice view of the runway on the way in. Traffic. 
yeah, I forgot to turn the um, TCAS to TA instead of TARA. So it's trying to react to traffic nearby. I'm just watching the indicated airspeed here. We can go very slow in this little 737-600. It's quite amazing, actually. We're just doing 110 knots, which is not advisable. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. But look at the others. Look at the stall speed. It's 80 knots. I mean, OK, we've not got any passengers, I don't think, but they're still nuts. I'm just wondering how true that is. 100. Okay, so we just fish all night. 50, 30, 20, 10. Obviously, we can use reverses as well. Flaps up, brakes off. So on the rollback to the airfield, you would typically turn the APU back on at this point, just so when you get to the stand, you don't have to worry. So you can, you know, go through your powering down procedures. The stunning thing to me with that, obviously this is the first time I've flown this, was how slow we could go. That stall speed was like 80 knots. To Obviously that was the absolute limit, but oh, that's quite stunning to me, that you can fly this so slowly. Okay, so you obviously don't want to sit and watch me taxi all the way back and go through the reverse of the startup list. So I'm going to um, leave you while we're taxiing back. But yeah, this was the PMDG 737-600. Uh, we need to go and turn off the parking lights, by the way. Um, and yeah, I'm massively impressed with it. It's, it is very, very, very similar to the 700. So the internal systems are identical. So, you know, if, you're, if you've already got the 700, it's debatable whether you really need the 600 as well, but it is quite cheap. <coughs> I was actually quite surprised. I think PMDG have learnt the lesson now that they can actually sell twice as many at half the price. Or more. Um, I'm not quite sure what they'll do about the pirates that are obviously going to go and just copy the aeroplane around. But then I'd rather, you know, support the developers, so I've, I've paid the money. Um, yeah, so here we are. PMDG 737-600 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I think it's actually rather nice. So I'm going to pull us to a stop here on the uh, taxiway at Birmingham. And I'm going to leave you here. It's very, very nice, isn't it? OK, I'm going to leave you there. And I will see you again soon. And we'll do some flights over the next few weeks flying some continental routes, I guess, with the 737-600. See you soon.